in the, uh, the Adelaide Centre of Spine Research in the John O'Brien Library, which contains a valuable collection of rare and antiquarian books on the spine that number several hundred. Uh, this remarkable collection of books, uh, some of which were published in the 18th century, was collected by John O'Brien over many years. Last year, John most generously transferred the ownership of this wonderful collection to the Spine Society of Australia as a gift to the Society. John has not lived in Australia for the past 40 years, but uh, he decided that as his roots remained here, so should the treasured collection that he painstakingly acquired during those decades away. Now with me is John O'Brien himself, who's kindly agreed to talk on his life and times as it relates to spinal surgery, including the impetus for uh, this collection of books. Now John, perhaps the best way to, to start is to, to ask you how you first came to be interested in spinal surgery. Oh Rob, thank you very much. Um, that's a bit of a dolly of the first question, <laughs> and thank you. Um, I first became interested in spinal surgery um, in the early 60s when I uh, went away to uh, do postgraduate training in England. Um, I was approached by John Jens of Ballarat um, uh, to if, and, uh, asking if I'd do a locum for him as he wanted to leave Ballarat in uh, late 66 <coughs> and go abroad to, uh, to advertise and promote a very big international meeting which was, of which he would be um, one of the seniors uh, and it would be run in Sydney in 1970, the International um, Meeting of the English-Speaking World of Orthopaedic Surgeons. And uh, Jack Jens, Gen Z, to his mates, uh, asked me, I, I was just finishing my first uh, time in orthopaedic surgery, I was really a makey learn, as they say in Hong Kong, um, and he approached me and, I, and paid my fare back uh, to Ballarat, and where I, where I spent three amazing months working with his uh, assistant, Ron Beetham, uh, in, in a big clinic there at the St John of God Hospital, that really turned me, uh, that was really uh, the answer to the question you asked. Um, the first afternoon I was there, I assisted Ron Beetham do three anterior lumbar mm. fusions. And uh, my mind was set up from that time on. I went back to Britain that, uh, at the end of that year. And uh, Jack Jens had organised for me a, a, an AOA uh, year in Edinburgh, working with Professor Chip James. And uh, from there I organised to go on to Hong Kong. But that was the seeding in my skull. Uh, John Jones was a huge influence on me uh, starting in spinal mm. surgery. Mm. I guess a lot of people wouldn't have realised that uh, Australian surgeons were doing anterior lumbar work at that time, back in the 60s. I don't think they would have. Actually, anterior lumbar surgery, it was infrequent glo globally then. I mean, of course, there was Hodgson in Hong Kong. There was a big South African school always mm. with... Mm. Um, well, Sydney Sachs or...? Sydney Sachs one of them, and uh, the man who did the cord work. A Domacy. George Domacy. Yeah. There was always a big, but uh, Hodgson influenced all of these people. Mm. Mm. I don't think there was much anterior lumbar work being done. It had mm. been done, mm. it stopped and started to stop. But uh, I mean, to find it a, a, um, a whole um, field, a minefield, mm. but in Ballarat was quite amazing. Mm. Of course, mm. that, that was Hodgson's influence. Mm. Um, and of course, Jens, Jack Jen said, I, if I was interested in spinal surgery, I had to spend a year. Mm. Uh, I had to go to, to work with, Hong, uh, with Hodgson in Hong Kong, which I subsequently did. Mm. Well, you, you spent, was it eight years in Hong Kong altogether? I was actually eight years in Hong Kong. I went along in, early in, in 68. It was the year of the, the month of the Tet Offensive. Mm. You might remember the Vietnam War. And I... Uh, I uh, went along for a six-month attachment there, which Hodson had organised for me, attached to the Hong Kong University, 
as a lecturer and I'd been there a month and Hadi said to me, look, your face fits. I mean, the Chinese mm. quite enjoy being around here mm. and uh, you're not irritating me, so why not stay? <laughs> I mean, a lot of people went and visited him, but I mean, you must have been something special to have been asked to stay on to be well, on that. Well, Eight years is a long time. And well, it was. You see, I, I, I was absolutely electrified by what I was mm. seeing there in the mm. first few weeks. I couldn't believe it was against all the um, everything I'd been sort of taught in London and Edinburgh. Mm. I mean, he was uh, Hodgson, who had first started anterior surgery for spinal TB back in November 1955. Mm. So here I was 13 years later. I mean, it was so well established in Hong Kong and other parts of the world, but London had found great difficulty in accepting that. And I was always was a keen reader. Mm. And I was reading about Hodgson's uh, early works through the 50s and early 60s, I was reading his stuff. It was widely, uh, it was widely available in the journals, and I couldn't understand why other people couldn't sort of mm. understand that. Mm. I couldn't grasp it. And when I got to Hong Kong, it was so amazing as a place mm. and as a spinal centre. I I thought, what the hell am I doing mm. here? Why hasn't anyone else figured this out? Mm. I mean, he became recognised as the, the, the prime person in anterior lumbar work. I mean, people were visiting him, but it must have oh, taken yes. time for that to eventuate. Look, I'm not sure, Rob. I mean, looking back, six yes, I suppose word travel, you didn't have tra word travelling instantly mm. with, with computer and internet as mm. you do now. I don't know why. Things were just slow in those days. I mean, it was always the old-fashioned day, old-fashioned system. You needed to get something into a book, mm. a textbook, before it was accepted. So publishing in journals, which would take a couple of years to get an article in, you know yourself mm. from your work, it takes some years before mm. your thoughts and principles are accepted. Mm. Hodgson, it even took longer because it was a very radical approach to a very ancient disease, a tackling, mm. a, a, a tackling TB from the front. The disease was as old as mankind, and here was a man who was coming up with the answer at last. Mm. You had that uh, wonderful um, symposium that you organised uh, in '68, was it? With in the September '68, next to the time of the WPA, and obviously a lot of uh, major international surgeons came then. But were there other times when surgeons were coming, or was that the sort of pivotal time for the congregation of them? That was a particular time because uh, Alan Dwyer was in Hong Kong then and he did his screw and cable operation with, uh, for the first time outside of Australia just at the beginning of that meeting and so there were some very big international <coughs> figures at that meeting and I'm sure Hoddy had arranged for this. There was uh, the boss of the Campbell Clinic, uh, there was Bob Salter, Jack Kennedy from Western Ontario, Lloyd Griffiths, it was a large party of experts mm -hmm. and they took the word, the word travelled and Ed Simmons mm -hmm. from Toronto, where many many people were there and they took this word back that Hong Kong was mm -hmm. ablaze with uh, technology, invention, it was, and it was electrifying then, it was an amazing time to be alive as a young mm. man mm. in in a new, uh, in mm. a fairly new principle. Mm. So at that stage you were what middle thirties, I suppose. No, I was just 30, thirty, just thirty, 30 yeah. and I was just sort of feeling my way. Mm. I, uh, and it was just uh, it was a time of great excitement because every day was another invention. Mm. You know, mm. there was uh, on top of the TB and the anterior approaches for diseases and uh, spinal curvature, there was all the paralytic deformity, mm. all the polio, mm. residual polio, we didn't see too much acute infectious disease, but uh, there was an amazing amount of mm. orthopedic crippling disease that, and I was the clinical superintendent mm -hmm. in a 200 bed mm. children's orthopedic hospital, it was an amazing time. Mm. Mm. Obviously you formed a very close uh, relationship attached with Hodgson. Well, what sort of a person what was he like? Well, he was a wonderful man. He was very inventive. He was wild. He was a uh, son of Uruguay, Spanish speaking. His parents were Anglo Scot and they went out to build the railroad 
in uh, they, he lived in, in province Florida, just mm. outside of Montevideo. And I was later, in later years, I was a guest speaker of the Uruguayan Association and visited and met his, his sister Joan and met his nephews and nieces out there. Uh, he came from that background. He was at about age four, he was at boarding school in Kent in England. Mm. Uh, he then did medical school, uh, he was at medical school in Edinburgh. He was then, uh, he, was in a, he was a military surgeon in the Second War. He was of the same vintage as John Charnley. He, uh, he worked with Ken McKee, the, uh, hip, the hip surgeon uh, uh, expert. And uh, then when National Health, when the NHS came in, uh, which was 1948, for some reason, he couldn't get a job. Mm -hmm. And there must have been many people stuck like mm -hmm. this, all back as military surgeons back from the war, hundreds of them, and only so many jobs to go around in a state-run health service. And Hottie couldn't get a job, and, uh, and he was disappointed uh, interview after interview. Mm -hmm. He was then, by then married to Monica uh, with four young kids, and he really immigrated. Mm. to Hong Kong mm. to take a, to, to, to a lecturer's job in orthopaedic surgery mm. which he started in 1950 and of course that's where that's where really I think contemporary um, spinal surgery began. Mm. How was he viewed by the other the, uh, sort of locals, the, the Chinese? There? Well the locals feared him, he was a tough guy. Mm. Um, he was admired and respected uh, by most. Harry Fang adored him um, and Harry was a great pioneer and, and, mm -hmm. and, and was Hoddy's first fellow. Mm -hmm. um, most of them liked him. I mean he was a man, he, he was a tough man. Um, he was, uh, he could be quite, he could be very difficult. Mm -hmm. He could be difficult in a meeting if you put forward some thought or something off the top of your head. For example, I was thinking, if you said you'd been to Ayers Rock, he would say, who was Ayer? <laughs> <laughs> and if you think of all yeah, the yeah. illnesses and diseases that oh, some yes, guys yes, made in front, he'd yes, say, well, yes, can you just enlighten yes, who was he? Yes. You, couldn't, you couldn't use a word loosely without no, knowing something no. about it. Right. So he, mm. he kept the, the place fairly clean. Yes. There were places, there were, we had several clinical meetings a week which he chaired mm. and he would always mm. sit in front and be there five minutes early for mm. any meeting. Mm. He was absolutely fastidious like that and you wouldn't cross him. Mm. Uh, there was a guy in later years, several years, well no, in my time, who uh, was deliberately late for meetings and he was told one, uh, one Monday morning when he arrived late for like the tenth time that he wanted him out of the colony mm -hmm. by the end of the week mm -hmm. and he had to get a trip mm -hmm. back to Europe. Mm -hmm. So he didn't tolerate fools. He was a bright guy, massively energetic and uh, I adored the man. I mean I mm -hmm. thought he was, he was so much fun, so mm -hmm. crazy in a way. Mm -hmm. uh, but he was a huge influence. Uh, a lot of people had difficulty with him. He was a slightly, um, he, he was difficult if uh, he could, I'm trying to put this, with some, some Americans had great difficulty with mm -hmm. him. Mm -hmm. He wouldn't tolerate bullshit. Mm. And uh, he made that very clear from an early time in the meeting. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but I thought he was, I thought he was a wonderful guy. Mm -hmm. He was a great, I thought he was a huge influence on, mm. as I, I think you probably mm. understand, mm. Yeah. on 20th century spinal surgery. Mm. Mm. And what is not understood, I mean, what is not appreciated, he was the founding father of the Western Pacific Orthopaedic. Yeah, right. He was the founding father of sort of orthopaedics in Asia, really, mm. from the, mm. the early 1950 mm. on. He formed alliances with people like Donald Gunn in Singapore, Huckstep in Uganda, and other people. He had a huge care, he was a very caring guy. Mm. He started mm. the vaccines for mm. polio yes. uh, in Hong Kong, which was the end of crippling in, in mm. that part of Asia. Mm. And 
I thought he was a wonderful man. Well, obviously, a lot of the operative procedures that he was carrying out were, were unique. I mean, uh, first, he, did he go about that uh, by doing cadaver work, or was it something that just came to him at the time when... I mean, obviously, the Chinese population are very slim, so technically probably is a bit easier than, uh, than working on uh, uh, sort of average... Um, Caucasian with yes. a much bigger build. Well, that is very true. The, the technical side to these operations was a lot easier than operating in mm. Adelaide in 2009. Mm. Uh, but um, the, I asked Hoddy where the seed was sown for this. Mm. Many years ago I interviewed him. And he said that um, when he first went into, a cadaver, into the cadaver room studying mm. anatomy, or maybe but must have been doing anatomy <coughs> for... for uh, as an undergraduate, he was aware that when it was at a, doing post mortem, so halfway through mm. medical school, he was aware that when the corpse was eviscerated, that the whole spine was on the view yeah. from to the upper cervical spine down to the pelvis, and he realised immediately mm. its accessibility yeah. if you had the right technical mm. approach. Mm. Mm. I think that was a, a very, uh, it was a. a what seemed very commonplace and very obvious now, I mean, that was quite an observation 50-odd years yeah. ago. Now, you mentioned uh, Alan Dwyer and uh, the demonstration case he did oh, yes. at that time. Uh, what was the relationship between Hoddy and Dwyer? Oh, they were like brothers, really. Uh, Alan Dwyer um, invented this screw and cable technique for the correction of scoliosis back in 19... I think he did his first case in 1962 or 63. Uh, he had difficulty uh, selling this idea, selling the thoughts uh, and the anterior approach for scoliosis. He had difficulty in Sydney where they thought he was a bit daft. He was actually the most brilliant and lateral thinking surgeon I'd ever seen and I had I knew him like a friend, a very mm. close friend. And um, Hoddy, uh, Alan Dwyer, having difficulty uh, uh, with this um, uh, operation and the whole, th the problems there must have been around in the early 60s mm. getting this thing uh, accepted by yeah. his oh, peers. Oh, un un unbelievable. So anyway, uh, Alan Dwyer, Hoddy told me this, Alan Dwyer showed him a little uh, slide of a mm. uh, uh, spine with this screw, all the metal mm. titanium screws stuck in the side and the cable down. And Hoddy said, look, you must, uh, you must carry on with this, Alan. This is wonderful. They'd met at an AOA mm. meeting in Australia. Yeah. And Alan said, well, I've got no pals in Sydney that are sort of interested in, in doing this. Although mm. I must say, so the late Cecil Cass his partner was a yeah. great uh, supporter, yeah. but he needed some major surgeon yeah. with, ac with the access. Yeah. And Hottie said, well, look, uh, Harry Tyre is your man at yeah. Prince Alfred yeah. in Sydney. And uh, Alan said, well, I, 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 I think Alan didn't know him. Really? I think, but I may be wrong. Anyway, Hottie got this, this pair of them together and mm. working. And uh, from this must have been from the mid-60s on, they were doing one case at the Marta Hospital mm. and then a weekend on a Saturday right. morning later they'd be doing one at Prince Alfred right. Hospital. Mm -hmm. I, I say that um, Harry told me that uh, Hugh Barry uh, was very keen to uh, take the screw and cable and uh, take it on as the Prince Alfred screw and cable oh, yes. uh, right. instrumentation. Right. And Harry, bless him, said, look, there's no way you can do this. I mean, mm. this is Alan Dwyer's idea, mm. and it stays with him. And I'm mm. pleased, I mean, that was no yeah. of Harry. Yeah. But uh, that was uh, an important liaison. The pair of them worked very, very well. And, of course, Hoddy put the, the, those two together. Then Alan used to come up to Hong Kong often, most mm. years, and he would mm. stay with me when he came up. Mm. and would work, would do demonstration cases and operate. Yeah. The time he came up in September 68 during mm. that Western Pacific meeting, I think he would have done three or four cases mm. with Arthur Yao and myself. Mm. And uh, it was extraordinary. That changed the whole pattern. So at that, at that stage he was doing the approach himself, because before that it, it was developed with the 
with a, uh, a general surgeon, wasn't it? There was Noel Alan Newton, Dwyer. of course. Yes. Noel yes. Newton was involved, and of course Arthur Sherwood was involved as the bioengineer. Yes. But Noel Newton, who was probably the best technical surgeon I'd ever seen, and was a chum of, of Alan Dwyer's from way, way right. back. They're old friends. Mm -hmm. Noel helped him in those early, early yes. years. That's yes. right. And uh, that's right. I was thinking of... Uh, Harry came in as an orthopaedic surgery, right. surgeon with yes. anterior yes. knowledge of anterior access yes. to the spine. Yes. But Noel was fabulous mm. and uh, the early publications included uh, Dwyer, uh, Noel Newton and Sherwood, the bioengineer. Yes. 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 Mm. I gather, I mean, he did a number of cases there. I remember hearing that uh, and everyone has problems and mistakes on one occasion someone put the x-ray around the wrong way what was the story well there? i was there for that that Where? was one saturday morning and so that was one of the three right. or maybe the fourth case right. in september 68 a young guy with a neuro a young teenage fellow with a neurofibromatosis spine and a nasty double curve uh alan was going was ready to access it jacqueline perry was there and a couple of other visiting america it must have been the week after this western pacific pacific meeting and um, I remember as, uh, I was in on the case, washing hands, scrubbing, and, and a visiting surgeon came in and turned the x-ray around <laughs> saying, look, in the, in the SRS, we always view the spine from the back. Yes. So you've got to view it yes. from the back. Yes. It, it, quite irrespective of the fact yeah, that... It's done for the front. The, <laughs> the front. And the x-ray had been put yes. up by Alan Dwyer yes. who was going to do it. Yes. So... One thing led to another, and the wrong curve was opened. Right. So that they were trying, we were then trying to instrument up to T4 or T5 right. and trying to right. make, the mistake had been made yes. was yes. turning the X-ray yes. round. Yes. And then that just went on and magnified. Yeah. And finally there was a, the titanium screw was put across the back of the spinal cord mm. at about T6 level. Right. We explored the kid at nine that yeah. night, and nothing yeah. ever ever came no. back. He got no. an empyema. Yeah. I don't think he lasted very long. No. Yeah. It was one of the first. It was the first fatality with it. Right. And fortunately, mm. not many. I, I no. believe. No. Now tell me, I mean, you, what was the um, catalyst for spending the year with Alf Narkomson? And where well, you did your PhD on the halo pelvic apparatus? Right. Well, I w the halo pelvic work I'd started in Hong Kong in 1969, and it was extraordinary how much correction you could get with curves. It was amazing. And, uh, of course, you lengthened it. There were side effects and complications with spine uh, cervical spine lengthening, but we were taking these patients out of the millimetre a day, mm -hmm. and there was osteoporosis, and there were other, other problems, but the curvatures were corrected dramatically. What we didn't know were the what forces were involved, mm -hmm. and uh, Nackhamson was then d had done previously, uh, some years before, some intravital wireless telemetry, and it seemed to me an appropriate thing to get more knowledge about the forces we were applying on the spine. Here we were putting huge <coughs> forces yes, through yes. a halo and a pelvic hoop. I was just, I was just interested to know. I thought it would help in the development of the technique further sure. and in patient care to get some idea about the forces and their dissipation because mm. the mm. forces were all falling off and the patients were loose before you tightened mm. them up the mm. next day. Mm. And Nackhamson was the only man who would really addressed this, uh, this problem of finding forces on the spine. And uh, we invited him out to Hong Kong and uh, uh, we did some joint work together and uh, uh, that led to me going back to Sweden. I did a PhD over there on the halo, halo pelvic traction technique and, uh, you know, the engineering principles involved. It was an interesting year I had in Gothenburg. I mean, Alf Nackham was a very, very different personality from... Uh from Hodson oh, <coughs> in a totally I, different uh, I don't, approach. I don't think they <coughs> would have spent much time in the same room together. No, no. I don't remember them spending much time. Mm. They were they were courteous to one another, but they were quite. They came from different ends mm. of the 
of the universe. So, so I mean, how did you yourself find it there personally, having been uh, working for so long in uh, an area which was extremely aggressive and surgically minded to one which was the, the opposite? Um, well, it took a bit of adapting. I mean, the first thing when you work in Sweden is you have to spend each morning studying the Swedish language, which is a state <laughs> gift to you. And uh, so I was speaking a bit of Swedish at the end to Swedish patients. Right. Uh, it, it, the Swedish got to be about as good as my Cantonese got with right. the Chinese right. patients. Uh, but they were, there was a good year there. Um, it was, um, Alf was a different, Alf was fairly Teutonic, you know, mm. it was quite, uh, he ran it uh, with a rod of iron. Um, the diseases were so different, I mean, God, there was mm. only, uh, what I did see with Nackinson was a huge amount of idiopathic scoliosis. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was Alf's trump card. Yes, which he generally treated conservatively? No, well he braced a lot, but when they mm. got over say 50 degrees or so, yes. the curvature, he was putting in Harrington rods. Mm. And there were two, at least two Harrington rods going in a week. Were there? But what, mm. oh yeah, at least mm. two, and that's not a big population because people million. tend to associate Narcosin with uh, non-intervention and uh, I guess a lot of it's with that goes to that, that great debate he had with uh, John Hall over he, when he oh, argued yes. on the conservative yes. management <laughs> versus the, the operative uh, one but well, he was no, actually, actually doing quite Alfie a lot of surgery. Was he? he wasn't <clears throat> a bad surgeon, mm -hmm. he was quite a competent surgeon, he'd been a pupil of um, the guy from um, the Karolinska I'll think of his name. Carl Hirsch. Carl Hirsch. Yes. He was a Carl Hirsch protege. Yes. yes. And um, Carl, I'd met in earlier at an earlier time. Mm. I'd met him. He'd been coming through Hong Kong, uh, and uh, Alf was uh, yes. He. I mean, the conservative management, the bracing of scoliosis mm. was it, mm. and the bracing clinic. What struck me was not the braces or the Harrington rods. Uh, well, all, they were, all these girls were sort of 14 or 15, they were all tall, statuesque, blonde, mm -hmm. Nordic girls. Mm -hmm. They all had right-sided thoracic curves. Uh, I couldn't believe how, I mean, coming from Hong Kong, where they were all four, sort of four feet in yes, height, yes. and where idiopathic curves were not common there mm -hmm. at the time, they've probably taken over from paralytic curves since, mm -hmm. But all these co girls were tall, they all had, they were all blonde and all had right-sided curves. Right. I thought there's got to be, this etiology, surely I'll be able to crack while I'm in Goth. Right. <laughs> and here we are talking yes. 35 years yes. later and no, yes. no one's even scratched no. the surface. No. Yeah. There's no clear causation of idiopathic mm. scoliosis, mm. which drove me out of the deformity work and into the back pain, mm. really. Mm. But uh, it was an interesting time in Sweden, um, quite different to Hong Kong. I was glad I went there. Um, so was this halfway through your Hong Kong No, it was getting or? towards <laughs> the end, Rob. I think I probably, Eileen, I went with Eileen, my, mm -hmm. then my wife, and Madeline, my 18-month-old daughter. And we had a year there. And I would have had, would have been seven. It was the time just when that first oil crisis started. It must yeah. have been 73, mm -hmm. 74. Mm -hmm. So I would have had another year in Hong Kong after I left. Yes. Uh, of course, it's well known that the the meeting you organised in '68, which then followed on, led to that sort of um, Ballarat meeting after the combined meeting you referred to in 1970. That's in Sydney. right. And you had a lot to do with the organisation of the of the uh, of the meeting itself, and that led on to to the Facet Club, mm -hmm. which then became the Spine Society, and it also led on, in, in some people's view, to the formation of Vessels. What what do you remember about that uh, Ballarat meeting, and what was important about it? Oh, it was amazing. Well, I it would have been a day or two after the post conference meeting. The the main meeting of the English speaking world was in Sydney. There was a post congress meeting in Melbourne and then a sort of side tour to Ballarat for the Spinal Symposium that Ron Beetham had arranged. Um, I remember the guys there, I remember it and I think you've got the photograph yes, here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Alan Dwyer was there, Harry Farfan was there, Ron Beetham, Jack Jens, 
uh, John Grant. There was a new, there was a uh, Ed Simmons, um, Harry Farney from uh, Vancouver. Those guys were, it, it was such an enthusiastic group. Mm. Uh, Alan Dwyer spoke and so did, I mean, there was uh, two days of talking. Mm. Um, and uh, it followed a similar pattern to what I, the meeting, the first yes, meeting I yes. had. And there was a lot of buzz through that meeting at about that, and around that time about where do we go from here? Look, we've got all these exciting things going on in um, uh, Sydney and Hong Kong and uh, Toronto. I mean, let's have a get, let's, we need to have an occasional meeting, an annual meeting. What can we do? And that was where the seed was sown, mm. ultimately for Issels. Yes. Yes. Now, of course, the Facet Club formed uh, a year or so after that. And I suppose Adam Dwyer, who was the, uh, the first chairman of that, was clearly the natural person mm. to take that mantle. Uh, do you remember, was there any discussion at the time? Were you involved in that formation? About the first of the Facet Club? Yes. No, I don't remember that. No. I don't think there was. Uh, what, regarding the chairmanship? No, just the formation of it at that time. No, I don't remember. I just remember the Facet Club was formed. I was out of it because I'd been in Hong Kong for a couple of years then. Mm. Um, I think the fa I, Ron Beetham would have was always, yes. remained always yes. a friend and would have kept me up to date and corresponded with me about it, but I don't remember any chat no. about that then okay. at the time. Let's just move on to the next phase. You, you uh, uh, moved from Hong Kong to Oswald Street. How, how did that come about? Well, I'd been in Hong Kong six or seven years. Hodgson was about to retire, which would have been in mid-75, when he was 60. And uh, Arthur Yao was going to take get the chair. Just at that time, when just about a year before that, I got this letter from a Professor B.T. O'Connor in Oswestry telling me he'd trawled the world and looking for a spinal man to set up a department and his eyes had rested on my <laughs> name, <laughs> as you can imagine. Yeah. The word trawling is interesting. Trawling was, was he, interesting. He saw you as a, a small fish or a big fish? A, 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 a small, <laughs> small salmon. <laughs> oh, God. Anyway. Had, had uh, you met him before? No, I didn't know no. him from a bar of no. soap. Yeah. So anyway, um, I went... So I thought, well, this is interesting, and Eileen and I chatted about it, and thought, well, I mean, by then, this is before my year in Sweden, but by then I was determined that spinal surgery would be my future because of just what I'd done, and I was so, and no one else was doing anything, and I could see an, uh, uh, there was a niche. Mm. And so I, um, I um, focused on this uh, this time, it seemed like there weren't many full-time jobs around. I'd, mm. I'd approached Professor Taylor in Sydney um, during that combined meeting in 1970, and there was not going to be any future there, no, no immediate future. Mm. And so the Osmostry thing was attractive. I'd always wanted to come back to mm. Australia, to mm. Sydney specifically, mm. but I mean, I was getting quite specialised in my. You've been out of the country for a I'd long time. I've been out of the well, country for a few years, yeah. and it was.